Good day, everyone. Welcome to this ISN KDGO webinar on kidney transplantation and cancer. My name is Greg Knoll. I'm a transplant nephrologist in Ottawa, Canada. And I had the honor of being the co-chair of the recently published KDGO guidelines on the evaluation and management of candidates for kidney transplantation. I'm joined today with our presenter, Dr. Jermaine Wong from Sydney, Australia. Dr. Wong is also a transplant nephrologist. She's the director of the Western Renal Service and is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Sydney. Dr. Wong was a member of the work group for the KDGO Transplant Evaluation Guidelines and co-authored the section on malignancy. She's also co-chair of the Onco-Nephrology Cancer Transplantation KDGO Steering Group. Dr. Wong is an expert and really I'd say the world leader now in cancer and transplantation. Her PhD thesis was on cancer in the setting of CKD, and since that time has dedicated a good portion of her career to evaluating unique interplay between malignancy, CKD, and the immunosuppressed state of kidney transplantation. Today, Dr. Wong will be discussing cancer screening and prevention for transplant candidates, with a particular focus on the recent KDGO transplant candidate guidelines. This should be a really interesting presentation and we're going to leave ample time for questions. So everyone, please uh, submit your questions as the presentation is going on and you can type them, <clears throat> excuse me, you can type them in the questions tab, which is in your control panel at any time during this presentation. So now I'd like to hand over the uh, floor to Dr. Wong. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you all for attending the webinar. Um, today, we're going to talk through some of the uh, recommended guidelines by the KDGO Working Group on Cancer Screening and Prevention um, of, in Transplant Candidates, and I have nothing to disclose. Um, this is an overview of my talk. So, uh, we're going to look uh, at some of the uh, cancer epidemiology in kidney transplant recipients, strategies to prevent cancer, including screening for our patients, what are the key criteria for screening um, and evidence of screening in transplant candidates. We also look at our guidelines development and also the scientific evidence to support re the recommendations um, and the current recommendations for cancer screening in transplant candidates. Um, last but not least, we um, focus on our potential candidates with prior cancer, um, looking at some of the recommendations for listing and transplantations in this population. So um, this is a um, work done by the SONG group, the Standardized Outcomes in Nephrology Transplant Initiative, which has defined cancer as an important outcome for transplant recipients and should also be included as the all core outcomes for clinical trials of patients with kidney transplant. So why it is so important well, because it is a relatively common problem for our transplant population. This is data from the Australian and New Zealand Dialysis and Transplant Registry, uh, including all our kidney and kidney pancreas transplant patients over a period of 20 years. As you can see here, if one lives up to 20 years post-transplant, the cumulative incidence for any cancer exceeds over 40%. 25% uh, for skin and 15% for solid organ cancers. The risk of cancer development is also dependent on the cancer type and is largely driven by immune and re viral related cancer. This is a summary slide of the standardized incident ratio of the various cancer types and it is defined as the incidence of cancer in a specific population of interest relative to the age and sex matched general population. As you can see here, it ranged from an SIR of over 10 uh, for Kaposi sarcomas to approximately two times for common solid organ cancer, such as lung, colorectal and other GI type cancers. Some cancer types such as breast and prostate cancer, interestingly, are not increased in the transplant population. 
Not only are the risk of developing cancer is increased in transplant recipients, the relative risk of death is also increased as shown here by the standardized mortality ratio. Um, ranging from over 50 times for non-melanocytic skin cancer to approximately twofold for um, lung and digestive cancer. And this data are consistent across the different Western countries. This is a really nice observational study that linked the transplant registry in the US to the cancer registry. The study looks at the risk of cancer with various degrees of graft, graft function. And the authors have classified the various cancer types into infection, immune and ESKD related malignancy with a relatively long follow up time. Um, noted that there is a seesawing pattern, an increased risk of infection and immune related cancer amongst those with good graft function but the pattern is reversed for cancer that are related to ESKD such as the urothelial and renal cell cancer. However despite stopping immunosuppression during times of graft failure the baseline cancer risk never returns back to its pre-transplant state. So given that cancer is such an important problem in our population strategies are definitely needed to prevent the development of cancer after transplantation. And these strategies should start early, that is before they've been transplanted. And one of the few strategies that are effective in a general population is screening. Screening is an important concept because it aims to detect abnormal precancerous lesions in a target population such that we could eradicate these lesion early to prevent the development of aggressive and advanced stage malignancy. However, an effective screening program must fulfill all of these specific criteria. The condition must be an important health problem. Um, the condition should be a recognizable latent or early symptomatic stage. We need to know about the natural history of the condition. There is an accepted treatment strategy for patients with the disease. The suitable test must also be accurate and that it should be acceptable to the population and that there is an agreed policy by the clinicians, the policy makers and patients as to how to treat them. The program must be cost effective for the population of interest. And that shouldn't, screening shouldn't be a once and for all uh, project. It should be a continuing process. However, the current evidence for cancer screening specific to the population, our transplant population is limited solely, unfortunately, to case series and observational data. There are no randomized control trials to inform decision making. So given such limitation, it is crucial that we provide the appropriate recommendations based on reasonably sound scientific database. And then the reason that we've developed these guidelines are to assist patients, clinicians and caregivers about the most appropriate healthcare interventions with the goal of improving the quality and access and process of care. And during the KDGO guidelines development process, we summarize the current medical knowledge using the most up-to-date data. We then appraise it and provide a relevant information about the scientific evidence base supporting these information recommendations. So now look at the strength of the recommendations that we use in the de development of these recommendations. We use level one grade, that is the term we recommend when most patients would want the recommended, recommended course of action or when most clinicians feel that the patient should recommend the course of action and that the recommendation should be evaluated for policy development as well as performance measure. We use a level two grading that is the term we suggest when the majority of the patients would want the recommendations but many would also not. And most clinicians have uh, may have different choices for their patients and that the recommendations are likely to generate debate. We would also use non-graders uh, to provide guidance that is based on common sense or when the topic does not allow adequate application of the evidence. We also then um, assess the quality of the evidence. 
we provide grade A level evidence indicating that we are absolutely sure and confident that the true effect lies close to the estimate of the truth. Um, and that is most of these evidence would have been generated from good quality trial based uh, evidence or from well conducted systematic review. A grade B indicates the true effect is likely to be close to the estimate of the effect, but there is a possibility that it could be different. And grade C means that the true effect may be substantially different uh, from the estimate of the effect. And grade D often indicates the quality of the evidence is extremely low and that it most likely comes from case series or case reports or, or evidence from expert opinions. And that the estimate of effects are absolutely uncertain that may also be quite far away from the truth. So for the cancer screening guidelines, we have provided a grade 1D for screening for breast, cervical and colorectal cancer, because most clinicians would recommend routine screening for their patients. However, the evidence supporting the recommendations are probably uh, of low quality and they're largely extrapolated from the general population. There are specific concerns regarding the test accuracies as well as the cost effectiveness of the screening strategies. So let's look at the test performance characteristics of mammography in a dialysis patient. Um, these are a couple of uh, observational data uh, back in the early 80s and 90s indicating that women on dialysis are at risk of having breast microcalcifications, thus leading to a risk of false positive results. What about the test performance of uh, fecal even chemical testing for bowel cancer in uh, patients with chronic kidney disease? Um, previously, we hypothesized that the false positive rates will be high, uh, knowing that patients on dialysis or with CKD may have dysfunctional platelets and greater use of antiplatelet agent. This is work done by our team, uh, looking at the test performance characteristics of fit uh, for screening bowel cancer across the different stages of CKD in over uh, 10 different sites and four different countries. Um, contrary to what we have uh, thought it may be, the test performance characteristics of fit test is very much similar to that in the general population, perhaps with the exception of the high risk population for those with antiplatelets and anticoagulation, where they have a high rate of false positive results. However, the risk of downstream complications from the colonoscopy uh, after the, the screening test um, is at least 20 to 30 times higher than that of the general population. Therefore, we must be extremely cautious in delivering care and these interventions, particularly around the high risk dialysis population. So what about some controversial uh, screening recommendations, such as for lung cancer? So in this uh, KDGO guidelines, we recommend chest CT for current and for heavy tobacco users as per the local guidelines and chest radiographer um, for other candidates and we grade it as 2C. And perhaps the reason we do that is based upon this systematic review of lung cancer screening using CT in high risk patients comparing to those um, with uh, chest X-ray. Um, the systematic in review indicated that a significant reduction in lung cancer mortality and all cause mortality for those using annual low dose CT screening compared with chest X ray. The reason that we have provided a grade 2C is that the data was largely extrapolated from the general population. Hence, the certainty of effects in transplant candidates are unclear and may potentially be substantially different to the truth and that some clinicians may recommend this and others do not and that it will generate a quite considerable amount of debate. What about uh, renal cell carcinoma? We recommend that 
um, to screen candidates at increased risk for renal cell carcinoma that is greater than three years on dialysis with a family history of renal cancer, with a history of acquired cystic disease and analgesic nephropathy with um, ultrasound. And we have graded this as non-graded. And what is the evidence? Um, because there really isn't a lot. And there are a number of things that we need to consider. And obviously the screening modality is very important. Whilst ultrasound is non-invasive, we are really uncertain about the test accuracies. As you know, they're often very operator dependent um, and there's only a single center study indicating a positive and negative predictive value of 194%. So we're really not sure. We're also unclear about the frequency of screening. But more importantly is about the harms associated with the screening strategies. And one of those is what we call overdiagnoses. That is picking up disease which are not clinically significant and hence potentially lead to the subsequent invasive procedure such as laparoscopic biopsy or nephroscopic nephrectomy. Not only that, we're also concerned about the financial burden on the patients, the anxiety um, and the emotional burden on our patient. Last but not least, we also have to think about the cost effectiveness of implementing such a strategies um, at a population level. So this is data from uh, many years ago, looking at the cost effectiveness of routine screening in uh, kidney transplant recipients, both of average risk and high risk population. As you can see here, um, for those with average risk, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio exceeds over 300,000 per life year say, which is certainly not cost effective. But for those of high risk, um, the ISA has reduced to maybe less than say $80,000 per life year save. And this is Australian dollar indicating that maybe they, they are relatively cost um, effective and that maybe they're good value for money. But again, um, given that this is solely based upon data from a general population, we're certainly uncertain about the true effect. What about the acceptability and screening uptake? Apart from understanding the cost effectiveness of the intervention, we also re really need to understand what patient's perspective and what they, they would do uh, in the context of a uh, population-based screening program. This is data from the Toronto uh, ICES uh, registry um, assessing the uptake of cervical um, cancer screening in women with chronic kidney disease. As you can see here, indicated at a dark gray line, patients with kidney transplants and those on dialysis um, is much less likely to um, uh, uh, experience cervical cancer screening compared to women in the uh, general population. And uh, this data is pretty much similar for those for breast cancer screening. So what about um, people with um, a prior cancer? Um, in this guideline, we also assess the potential transplant suitability of a candidate with prior history of cancer with a specific focus on the waiting time. This work again was done some time ago, assessing the totality of evidence and recommendations of the recommended waiting time for transplantation amongst those with various types of prior cancer. This of course was done before the KDGO guidelines were uh, published and developed. As you can see here, there were substantial variability in the recommendations. However, there were also some consistency for example, as you can see that metastatic melanoma, it is a definite no, but um, most um, recommend a waiting time between two to five years, obviously depending upon the grade, the histology of the original cancer diagnosis, as well as the um, specific cancer types. More recent data, which we have used some of this information in our recommendations indicate that there are interestingly no difference in the overall survival between candidates who had um, or did not have a prior history of cancer after transplantation. Uh, this is um, a very large Norwegian study, again, using the registry analysis. 
However, when we looked or when they looked specifically at the cancer specific death, there is an excess risk of approximately 1.5 times among those with a prior cancer compared to those without. What about weaning time and cancer recurrence? Again, with this specific uh, study, um, there are no association between the waiting time and the risk of death from recurrent cancer. Bearing in mind, this is an observational study, hence subject to a lot of potential biases, including selection and indication biases. A more recent systematic review assessing the prevalence of cancer recurrence after transplanting to, uh, uh, transplantation indicated an overall estimated recurrence rate of approximately 1.6 per 100 percent years. The absolute risk remained relatively slow, but as you can see that there are substantial variability uh, and heterogeneity between the studies. The event rate is small for most and appear to be a relatively rare disease. Um, amongst those who have waited for over five years before transplantation, this systematic view indicated that there is a lower risk of disease recurrence. Um, however, this review does not account for the stage or the histological status of the cancer. Um, clearly, given the nature of the study, it is again subject to confounding and also survival biases. But nonetheless, there is some indication indicating that waiting for you know, more than five years, we're less likely to develop cancer recurrence. So based on these observational data, this is what we recommend as a team. We recommend candidates with acute malignancy be excluded from transplantation, with the exception of several low-grade cancers such as prostate cancer, superficial non-melanocytic skin cancer, and also incidentally detected renal cell carcinoma. The timing of the transplantation after curative treatment is dependent upon these cancer type as well as the stage of initial diagnoses. We recommend no waiting time for candidates with curatively treated cancer such as melanoma in situ, very small renal cell carcinoma, thyroid cancer of low grade histology as well as superficial bladder cancer. But more importantly, despite that this is non-graded, Decisions about transplantation for our candidates in, in remission should be made collaboratively with the oncologists, our transplant colleagues, patients, and more importantly, their caregivers. I just want to show you and refer you to table 14 in the KDGO recommendations, and this provide a relatively good summary of what we recommend uh, in terms of the waiting times between cancer remission and transplantation. From this, we developed a um, kind of a decision-making framework. Um, I suppose when considering retransplantation in these potential, potential candidates, uh, we as clinicians must clearly communicate the risk of death with the patients. Uh, both the overall survival and cancer-free survival are dependent upon the tumor stage, uh, the type as well as the size in the context of current treatment and approaches probably generated from the general population. Clinicians should then factor in the effect of immunosuppression on the cancer outcomes. A lot of the times it is kind of a guessing game um, because again we don't really have a substantive uh, randomized control trials data. Then following the estimates of the estimation of cancer survival if the cancer recurs balancing against the expected risk of survival and quality of life on dialysis um, with the expected survival of a transplant without cancer recurrence. But to us, most importantly, um, as we have recommended, is that patient preferences and perspective of what specific treatment strategies they should, they prefer should be included in the decision before consideration of transplantation. This is a really lovely study done by uh, Dr. Noll and his team looking at the mortality um, uh, in incident um, 
uh, patient on dialysis compared to a uh, patient with uh, solid organ cancer. Uh, these are population-based studies using data again from the ICS registry indicating that uh, being on dialysis um, has probably lower survival probability than some cancer types such as the breast and even colorectal cancer. So we recommend as future research uh, to potentially model the trade-offs between deaths on dialysis from obviously cardiovascular disease and infection compared to the risk of cancer recurrence after transplantation as one of our research priorities. Um, but, but more importantly, we also think as a community, uh, a shared decision-making framework for cancer screening uh, in transplant recipients and candidates are critical, taking into account um, the clinical evidence, uh, the current resource used in your particular uh, population of interest. Um, clinician values and opinions are very important, but most importantly, uh, patient preferences and perspective of how they want it to be treated. So um, that I conclude my talk and thank you so much for uh, your attention and happy to take um, questions. Thank you, uh, Jermaine. That was uh, really an outstanding uh, presentation on cancer screening and prevention in the kidney transplant recipients. And I'm just looking at the screen. We have a large number of people online, which is excellent. And I encourage you all to uh, type in any questions. I can't see any questions just yet uh, coming in, but please type them in. We have Dr. Wong here who is an expert and can answer uh, all your questions in this field. So, Jameen, I'll, I'll kick off uh, some of the questions here. And I think, um, I think for myself and many nephrologists, what's often the most difficult thing to do is to counsel and see a patient who's had a previous history of cancer. And how do you approach um, patients who've had a PTLD with their first transplant and then have subsequently had a graft loss and are coming back uh, for the question of a repeat transplant when they've received some sort of treatment, usually rituximab with some other chemotherapy. Do you treat these patients uh, similar to other patients with a primary lymphoma or are these a very unique group of patients? Yeah, um, thanks, Greg, for um, uh, a very important question. And, and we often see this um, in young people uh, who had a transplant uh, potentially in childhood um, and then had a subsequent transplant because they failed secondary to PTLD or whatnot. Um, ideally, we would opt for a, another living donor. Um, because if they're well-matched living donor, we can uh, reduce uh, the immunosuppression therapy as much as we can. Um, if in the case that there are no living donors, obviously we have to resort to a disease donor and we'll try to provide the best matched donor as we can or we'll avoid any T-cell depleting agent as the first line induction therapy. And after that, um, obviously we would monitor these patients. I know this is very controversial in terms of whether we should monitor the EBV T-cell and most of these patients hopefully will be converted into serological positive. EBV, but if they don't, um, it is our routine, particularly in the young population, that we uh, routinely monitor the EBV um, uh, DNA status and reduce the level of, of immunosuppression as required. And sometimes we have to withdraw them completely um, if their teeters are certainly going up um, extraordinarily. Um, and um, yeah, hope for the best. And interestingly, our recent data also indicated people on tacrolimus, even with tacrolimus alone, with prednisolone, the risk of recurrence of these uh, PTLD is actually relatively small. I suppose this is because we selected a very highly uh, selected group of patients that may have some degree of survival bias. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Jermaine. Okay, I, I see a few questions have appeared now. Here's one from Dr. Murakami. Uh, could you touch on the screening strategy after transplant? Uh, are there any specific strategies for myeloma, MGUS, or MGRS? Oh, sorry, I guess this is two questions. Are there, so is there, could you touch on screening after transplants? The first question. The second question, is there any specific strategies for myeloma, MGUS, or MGRS? Should they be treated before transplant, given the risks of recurrence? 
Um, yeah, look, I'll answer the very first question. So we, if you look at the 2009 KDGO recommendations for um, cancer screening in uh, transplant recipients, so that's about 10 years ago, the guidelines recommend uh, population-based screening as per the general population. And I suppose that's what we'll do um, because there really isn't any additional evidence uh, to support additional extra. However, I think in the young women, um, I'm talking about you know, young by means, middle-aged women who had a transplant, um, and often the current recommendations is to have either PET testing every three years or HPV DNA testing every three to five years. For myself and also for my colleagues, you know, in practice, we would probably bring that forward a little bit for, um, mm -hmm. more frequently, to say maybe uh, annually or even um, six monthly for those who one had a client with CIN. Um, so that's one thing that we will do. And what the other thing that we may also consider, particularly for this high risk HPV uh, group, um, is that we may even know that they are probably sexually active and have been exposed to HPV, um, we, we would uh, vaccinate them. Um, it is certainly not in our population vaccine program, but um, there is some emerging observational data indicating that there is some benefit of doing so. So that's the cancer screening questions. In terms of AMGAS, myeloma, and um, I think it was light chain disease, isn't it? Uh, we have provided some guidance as to whether we should um, uh, transplant these patients, or whether we should not. I think um, the consensus um, idea is that we should only transplant people with multiple myeloma or uh, uh, MRM or, or light chain disease, uh, provided that they're in complete condition and some of those who have had a autologous uh, transplant. Um, I don't think we actually have any recommendations for screening post. Um, and, and again, it is a very personalized approach afterwards. So there's so few evidence to actually support what we do. So I don't think I can provide any specific recommendations for that. Okay, what thank you. What would you do, Greg? Uh, something similar, I would agree. I mean, I, there's not much more we can do other than those specific treatments and really make sure that they're in a curative state, I would say. Yeah. Now we have another, another question. Um, another question is from Fernanda Ortiz. Uh, and this is about uh, the question stating, it's often difficult to discuss with the oncologist as their experiences often based with non-transplant patients. So how often do you get a categorical opinion from your oncologist? And I guess I would add, uh, what would the specific questions that you would ask, Jermaine, of your oncology colleagues if you did seek their opinion? Yeah, and we're very lucky. We, we do have an onco-nephrology kind of clinic and collaboration with our oncologist. And uh, we're very much in tune with them about their current recommendations and the chemotherapy, their uh, treatment or whatnot. Um, uh, and we, we have to take into account of our survive, patient survival and also the immunosuppression that we used and factoring into uh, their, their current treatment and recommendations. Um, I don't think there is a one size fit all um, uh, 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 kind of recommendations, but um, ongoing uh, dialogue and having a very specialized clinic does, does help um, because, you know, if you see enough, then you, you're probably able to treat uh, and have the experience to treat. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from uh, Kevin Fowler, who is asking, is there a maintenance immunosuppressive regimen that has shown lower incidence of can cancer, sorry, 10 years or longer? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, and so far from what we have reported and what others have reported, there are no single immunosuppression potentially apart from NTOL inhibitors may be beneficial um, for patients who have had a transplant and then develop malignancy. And I believe, Greg, you've done a systematic review and individual patient data analysis indicating people that had been on mTORs inhibitors um, had a much lower risk of cancer as well as cancer-related death. Um, however, they do have a higher risk of all-cause mortality. 
um, this is, I believe, are all um, serolimus related trials. So I suppose with um, patients um, who had a prior history of squamous cell carcinoma, and there's a lot in Australia and New Zealand, uh, we do switch them into a low dose TAC. Um, and also a combination with um, mTORs inhibitors, and that's what we typically do. We try not put the, put, to put them on Imaran because we've previously shown that there is a slight increased risk of seeing um, malignancy in this population. So um, that's what I would probably do. So People with, yeah, to sorry, clarify, which, which cancers would you use the mTOR inhibitors in? The definitive one is certainly the squamous cell carcinoma and obviously the Kaposi's. Um, with pre pretty much solid evidence now, I think. Mm -hmm. It is still quite uncertain for solid organ cancer. Um, sometimes we use them in the context of PTLD. Again, um, we would suggest, and what we normally typically do, is take out all the anti-proliferative agents and remain the patient on a CNI and prednisone. Mm -hmm. And with that combination, um, we were able to achieve relatively good cancer-free survival as well as good graft function. Thank you. Here's another question from Mitesh Singh, who is asking uh, from South Africa, would you suggest any different recommendations for low-resourced settings? Mm. Yeah, look, um, we, we talked about this, Greg, <laughs> with, our, with our, our guidelines development. Um, and I don't think there will be any substantive changes in terms of what we recommend in terms of screening um, and also post-transplant management. Um, th there shouldn't be any substantial differences on that one. What are your thoughts, Greg? We, we kind of talked about this quite a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think it's always difficult. I think, uh, I think your local resources will dictate what you can and can't do especially amongst um, diagnostic imaging and other consultants' opinions. So, um, I, you know, as with, re you know, recommendations are only recommendations and you can do what your health system can allow you to do, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's a few questions. Uh, people have a lot of interest about immunosuppression after cancer. So maybe we should talk about this just a little more, I guess. What, maybe I could rephrase a little, in what, which cancers would you definitively make a change in immunosuppression, whereas others, maybe breast cancer, for example, where you may not make any changes in immunosuppression? Do you have kind of an approach that you can share? Yeah, so PDLD definitely. Um, skin cancer and melanoma is definitely other cancer types that I would probably either stop the anti-proliferative agents or switch it to mTORs inhibitors. And that would be something that I would do. Uh, rare malignancies such as esophageal cancer are probably similar approach. Um, for the other cancers such as prostate or breast or thyroid cancer, given that we kind of found they're not kind of immune driven, I would kind of leave them as it is. Um, for our transplant patient, but obviously with regular surveillance and monitoring uh, after the cancer diagnosis. And what about the other big ones like colon and lung? Yeah. <laughs> Similarly, you know, um, if, if the patient has low immune, immune risk, um, you would back off as much as you can uh, to the possible level. But I wouldn't stop anything completely as such um, and also it depends upon the stage of the disease, disease and often unfortunately many of these patients um, are found late with metastatic disease and by then nothing could be done um, yeah okay uh, I'm just sorry I'm scanning through some of the questions um, a lot of these are very similar just a second uh, Okay, so uh, on the same note, do you adjust your immunosuppression at the time of the transplant? Uh, if someone you may be perceived at an increased risk or had a previous a cancer that they're you know cured from or whatever had a two-year wait, do you do you then alter your initial immunosuppression from your standard protocol of your institution? Yeah, in in, in our standard uh, our standard induction therapy in Australia and New Zealand are largely IL two receptor blocker, so we would avoid a T cell depleting agent as much as we can in high risk group. 
um, particularly those with a history of PDLD or skin cancer. Um, and we'll try to match them if, if possible with a good life donor uh, or uh, uh, ideally matched with a disease donor, but often that's not the case. Um, would we reduce it initially? Probably not, um, because one would think that they would have cured from the cancer before we put them on the waiting list. Um, but we would try to minimise immunosuppression after our protocol biopsy um, at one month as much as we can uh, to prevent cancer recurrence. Um, and I must say, of those that we have, and you can see, you've seen our data indicating that the actual risk of recurrence is actually very small in terms of the absolute risk mark. But um, unfortunately, you know, when they do recur, um, the risk of death from cancer is high. Here's a question from Samuel Kabinga, and you touched on it briefly earlier, Jermaine, but maybe we could expand a bit on your experience with treatment of Kaposi's sarcoma and how you would approach that. Mm, uh, Sorry, yes, most of um, when we do find an uh, Kaposi's, we will take out the CNIs or we'll definitely take out the antiproliferative and put them on Kaposi's. And it most most of the time it works. Uh, and mo uh, and mTOR inhibitors. And most of the time it works. Okay, so an mTOR inhibitor, and if they're on prednisone, leave them on the prednisone. Yeah, but I would. I mean, I would take them. There are a couple of these rare diseases, though. Certainly in our population, we've seen a couple. And one of them is actually donor derived, um, which is quite interesting. Um, and then once we take out the CNIs and the cell set and put them on mTORs. Um, they pretty much a curative. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> here's a slightly different question. We didn't really talk about the donors, but uh, have you ever? Would there ever be a circumstance in a low risk case, for example, of someone with breast cancer? Could they ever be a living kidney donor? That's another interesting question, and some of these issues will be coming through in the uh, oncology. Um, conference uh, publish will be published in international. So, um, in the context of a breast cancer, we would um, not recommend um, for donation if the donor had a prior history of cancer, unless it is a grade one ADCs with no lymph nodes involvement, and that the patient had been in remission for more than ten years. And that will be our recommendation. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I would admit we would be very conservative and would likely have said no to all of them previously, but things are definitely changing. Um, I, there's a few other questions. I think that's all for our type questions. I had a few others that I, I that I was thinking about as you were speaking. Um, I, I'm interested in that uh, paper from Norway that looked at the one-year wait and showed really no difference in uh, overall survival in patients who just waited a year and then had their uh, transplant. A couple of thoughts. Did, do you know if they looked at graft failure? Because as these patients get cancer, they often get treatments that may lead them to graft failure. That's one point. And how do you think <clears throat> moving forward we could actually study this to see if this is a reasonable approach? So how would we look at, you know, inching up and, and easing our restrictions in some sort of a controlled study? To, to see if this is a reasonable approach. Yeah, um, Greg, I didn't think they looked at overall graft failure um, from memory, so I can't answer that question, but I agree with you, that it's a very interesting question. Um, I don't think we can actually ever run a trial <laughs> of randomizing people into um, a, a weight group of more than five years or say a weight group for less than one year, it will be very difficult. I think that the, the, the problems are not the problems, the limitations of this type of registry analysis, it is highly selective as you would know. Um, and there are obviously reporting issues and confounded by confounding biases as well as the indication biases, obviously um, there is a reason why you only wait for five years versus a reason for waiting only one year. Um, unfortunately, they were not able to distill between the specific cancer types as well as the specific uh, histology. So again, it is very hard to, to conclude. But if you look at the uh, 
is a matter of you, again, it's subject to a lot of heterogeneity. There is a clear difference of people waiting between you know, five years compared to people with less than five years. There is a survival difference between the two uh, in terms of cancer-free survival. So look, I'm not sure what 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 would you what would you think um, be the best way of, of um, designing a, a study to look at that? Well, I guess I was thinking perhaps some kind of a cohort study where you would find some cancers that we would normally say, oh, you have to wait two years and then see if there were some perhaps way to look at the pathology in a little more detail or the risk profile in a little more detail and say this might be a lower risk one and, and let it go ahead and kind of see what happened and compare that to sort of standard. But I agree, it's a, it's a difficult study to move us um, you know, lower and lower down away from, I think, you know, we went from five years for a lot of these to two years, uh, and now some people thinking one year. So I'm yeah. just trying to think how we could actually study it to get some better um, evidence, but it would be challenging, obviously. Yeah. There, there is some work looking at the genomics of these cancers, specifically of, you know, what genetic type will recur more often, such as mammoprint, can, which is now commercialized. But again, you know, um, it's certainly not available in, in every single country. Uh, if we were to do that, even in Australia, it costs about two grand and it's not funded by the government. So it's really tricky uh, to define, you know, what specific ones will progress and what and what, you know, which one won't, yeah. I'm um, just seeing if there's any other questions. I don't see any, but I had one other uh, topic that we haven't uh, brought up, which wasn't really part of your presentation, but do you have any experience or have looked at the literature lately on the use of checkpoint inhibitors uh, post-transplant? Yeah, so there are a few case reports and we are going to publish a series on that one in the same series. Um, so unfortunately, and when we looked at the FUSE case reports, that there is a high risk of antibody immediate rejection, uh, particularly for patients with the, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors uh, used for metastatic melanomas and uh, also for metastatic lung cancer. And interestingly, uh, the team from, I think, New York, um, which published in the New England Journal of Paper, what they did was they induced the patient with high-dose steroids, convert them to mTORs inhibitors before the induction of checkpoint inhibitors. And for the two patients or three patients that they treated, and I believe that was metastatic melanoma, um, they, the patients actually did okay with no evidence of uh, uh, rejection. And I believe um, they sustain life for approximately another 12 months. The one that we did in Australia, and we've only used it once, and he died pretty much straight after the uh, checkpoint inhibitor was given uh, for metastatic melanoma. I didn't have the chance to reject, so um, few data. Uh, not sure <laughs> that would yeah. be the answer. My personal yeah. experience, we've used it two or three times with no, not very good outcomes, but uh, we had stopped, we did this early uh, when these first came out and we had, with the oncologist, had stopped all the immunosuppression when we started the checkpoint inhibitor except for steroids. And I understand some yeah. people are just going to, you know, low dose CNI and steroids with the checkpoint inhibitor, trying to balance it a little more. And I don't know if you had any experience with that or not. No, and um, what we, I mean, these are very, very sick patients and most of them we have to be honest, we've taken them off in this question. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, yeah. All right, oh, here's another question, sorry. Um, is there any um, specific considerations in an HIV positive recipient, any specific emphasis from Samuel Kabinga? Um, I'm sorry, I haven't looked into an HIV positive patients with cancer. Um, I, I really can't comment on that, apart from probably doing exactly what we've been doing in um, immunosuppressed patients with malignancy. Um, yeah, I, I personally don't have that experience. Greg, do yeah. you have that experience? No, I mean, I, I, I think Samuel is in South Africa, so obviously probably has more experience than most yeah. of us. I've <laughs> only, you know, we have a handful of patients in our clinic who are HIV positive who have done extremely well. Um, we've really had, you know, we've seen no 
excessive infection or cancer in any mm -hmm. of our HIV patients so far. So I'm I'm not sure we would do anything specifically different um, than what we're doing based on the HIV guidelines and transplantation. Yeah. Well, I think I don't see any further questions, Jermaine. I think what I'd like to do is perhaps close the session now. Uh, and again, I would like to thank the audience. Uh, we had a lot of people uh, with us today and a lot of excellent questions. And I hope uh, the audience certainly found this useful. And I, I would also like to obviously thank our presenter, Dr. Wong, for her excellent, uh, thoughtful presentation and the time she took to uh, answer these questions. And I would also like to put in a plug for the uh, KDGO transplant guidelines. These are now uh, published in the transplantation. These are the uh, overall guidelines on uh, evaluation of the Transplant Canada, which includes this section on cancer, and they are in uh, transplantation, as I mentioned. And I'm uh, hopeful that these will be very helpful in your practice. So uh, thank you again, uh, Jermaine, and thank you to the attendings. And uh, everyone, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.